Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Festival of New, Friday morning edition. My name is Will Milberg. I'm, I'm the dean at the New School for Social Research, and I am an economist and thrilled to be here to introduce this conversation between Naomi Wadler and Elaine Welteroth. People know both of them, so they need very little introduction. Naomi is uh, from Alexandria, Virginia, and uh, Elaine is in New York. Uh, they'll both come out on stage in a minute and uh, have a conversation. And they're both very excited to be here, and they very much want to talk to each other in front of you, and they very much want to hear from you as well. So uh, Naomi, of course, was deeply affected by the mass killing at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. She led with her friend Carter, now famously, virally, a walkout at her Virginia Elementary School for 18 minutes to honor the 17 plus one victims. She gave an absolutely riveting speech at the March for Our Lives rally in Washington, D.C. in March of last year where she not only talked about gun violence, but also about the racial and gender dimensions of the violence. She's a remarkable person. I've had a chance to talk with her a bit now, and, and uh, you have a real treat ahead of you. Elaine Welteroth uh, is the editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue and uh, began as beauty and health director of Teen Vogue back in 2012 and has been a transformative journalist and editor. And in the sense that she's been a driver of the change in the ethos and in the vision of that magazine, she has made it into something that is politicized, informative about the current events, about politics, about law, about social justice, and has made this incredible pivot that is so meaningful here at the New School on fashion and its social place and its relation to inequality and social justice. And this is something that we embrace um, very sincerely here at the Parsons School of Design and in all our efforts to think about kind of the social consequences of design, design decisions, and mass markets. And so Elaine is a pioneer and, uh, as I say, has transformed a major media outlet into something that now has enormous social import, enormous impact, and uh, something that was not envisioned 10 years ago combined with, with its kind of social media presence. So you have a real treat ahead of you. These are two people who represent not only ambitions of the new school, as I said, around fashion and social justice, things that are driven by students at the new school, and it's clear that they will continue to be driven by students uh, into the future when you meet uh, our interviewee uh, in, a, in a minute. These are people who really represent hopefully the future of the entire country, not just the direction of education and, and fashion. These are people who are going to change the way we think about mass consumption, the way we think about social change, the way we think about issues of race and gender in our everyday lives, and they are inventing new ways to bring about social change. I'm very, very excited to welcome and please give a warm welcome to Naomi Wadler and Elaine Welteroth. First of all, just <laughs> we bow down. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Hi. You guys can bring more energy than that for Naomi, who traveled all the way to be with us in New York. <laughs> That's more like it, thank you. So Naomi, I just have to say I'm so excited to be able to talk to you today. I am one of the many millions of people that remembers the moment that you stood on stage and delivered that poignant speech. Um, and I think I speak for everyone in the room when I say that that image of you and your magnificent fro <laughs> 
is forever etched into all of our minds and our hearts. How many of you guys in this room remember that moment? <laughs> and just out of curiosity, how many people in this room consider themselves activists? Yes. All right, I just want to get a feel of who, you know, we, we're, talking, we're talking amongst family yes. here. Okay, um, so let's, I want to start with that moment um, on stage because it is the moment that you were introduced to all of us in the room and, and millions of people in the world. Um, what was it like to be a 10 years old, 11 years old, oh 11, 11 years old, standing on that stage delivering that message? Take us back to that moment. Well, it was so crazy. And one of the things that gave me that confidence was the buildup. Um, when I was writing my speech, it, it was really hard. Um, I remember being so engrossed in all the work that the other activists were doing, but I didn't quite know how to do that myself. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that they could do it, but I didn't know that if I, I didn't know if I could live up to that standard. And so my mom ended up talking to me, and she was she told me that well, what do you? She asked me, what do you start with? I said, my name is Naomi Wadler, and through that we kind of started talking um, through the speech. I really wanted to talk about gun violence, and that's I realized soon soon that it, that wasn't my personal message, that's not something that's affected me in my everyday life, and so therefore I cannot speak with true authenticity about it. And so I was trying to think about what I could think about, mm -hmm. or what I could talk about, um, which was black girl magic and who we are. Um, and so then I ended up talking about how black girls are affected by gun violence and how their stories aren't told. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was something that I understood so fully, and something that I had the, I had the ability to explain in a way that it was unique to myself, and I was I was really nervous, um, and I was expecting a couple hundred people. And so when I went to the, so when I went to the march, and there were almost a million people there, it was really crazy. Um, I didn't really know what was going to come from it, but it was an amazing experience. It was, and I was one of the many people in the audience um, who was moved to tears. Um, and um, I remember I was there covering the event for ABC News, and after you spoke, I was asked to turn to camera and talk, and I, nothing came out. <laughs> nothing came out um, because I was that moved. Um, so let's back up a little bit and talk about how you even uh, kind of got identified as someone who should speak yeah. on that stage. Um, so after Parkland, students all over the nation organized walkouts. You were one of those students, mm -hmm. but there was something a little bit different about your walkout. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so my elementary school didn't want me and my friend Carter to plan a walkout because that wasn't appropriate for our age, and we did it anyway. But, um... <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can round of applause for that. And one thing that made our walkout different was that Instead of for the 17 minutes, um, instead of the 17 minutes for the 17 killed in Parkland, Florida, we added one more minute for Cortland Arrington, um, who was a black teen shot and killed in her school in Alabama by her boyfriend, and she was getting no media attention at all, and that angered me so much. The person to t tell me was my mom, because the news is always on in the background in my house. We're always talking about politics um, and tragedies like that, but I had never heard anything about Cortland, and it had happened like a few days ago, and so I was pretty confused. And so it was actually my friend Carter's idea, mm. um, which I think is so great because he's white and he was able to recognize that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we came up with that idea to add 18 minutes. And I just, I think that is, I, I don't know, I just, it was just a great opportunity. And um, I felt like after that, a bunch of people came to the walkout, the Guardian um, walked with us to our school. Um, I felt like I could really do anything and that I had the ability to tell stories. Mm -hmm. mm. So I think there's almost no one in America who hasn't heard about the tragedy in Parkland and the stories that came out of Parkland after the shooting. However, we know that there are unfortunately so many mass shootings that happen at schools and outside of schools. Um, and a lot of those stories never get told, particularly the stories of people of color mm -hmm. and young black people. Of course. Why do you think that is? And why did you decide to use your platform um, that particular day to really highlight the stories of those, th those un untold stories? Little black girls and little black boys, little kids of color, even in general, get shot in the inner cities of Chicago and DC and New York, and nobody cares as much as they did 
as when the white kids in Parkland, Florida were shot. And that is so disgusting to me. Um, I'm not trying to take away from what happened in Florida. I am trying to take away from the media for only putting the spotlight on them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's just because we're not, our lives aren't valued as much as the white kids who live in Parkland, Florida. I think it's because we're not seen as being worth anything mm -hmm. and our lives don't carry as much importance as the kids, as the white kids do. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I'm able to understand why that is. Um, it's, it's just a really complicated topic, and as a black girl, I, I don't think I can understand why my skin color and my gender makes me less worthy of attention and um, potential. Mm. And so I, I really just thought that if I was able to talk about something that I've been experiencing my whole life, um, it, would, it would benefit a lot of people, it would benefit myself, because mm -hmm. then I could really try to understand better what was happening and try to educate other people and raise awareness about stuff that's important to me. Were you scared? Yeah, I get nervous before everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was just nervous. Can you tell at all? <laughs> She's a pro. But, but, but really, I want to I wanna lean into kind of the root of the fear of talking about these kinds of really weighty, yeah. controversial topics that we're taught not to discuss, yeah, right? I Race knew. makes people uncomfortable. So let's ignore it mm -hmm. and let's pretend that we don't see it. But you did something that was really brave, really, really brave, even for adults to do. And you did it at 11 years old. You, you, you really shined a light on the issue of racism and how it intersects with this larger issue of gun violence in America. Where did you get the courage to do that? And Talk about the fear, any fear that you had that came yeah. up. So I've always had these conversations with my mom. I think the earliest conversation I had about race was kindergarten. Um, so a boy asked me why I was brown. And I said, because God made me that way. So I went home and I had a conversation with my mom because the boy didn't seem very nice about it. He was kind of like, why do you look different? Um, and then when I was five, I think that same year Trayvon Martin was shot. And I asked my mom why, because the news was saying that he didn't do anything, and they were confused. And I said, well, if he didn't do anything, and he wasn't armed, and he was just being a good boy, why was he shot? And she said, because of the color of his skin, because he was a brown boy, because mm -hmm. he, somebody didn't think he belonged in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I, ever since then, I've kind of questioned everything I saw in regards to race. Um, I, I asked my mom, I have been, um, since the march, why they identified black people, black criminals as black on the news, but not white criminals as white. Um, and I, I was scared because every time I would try to have those conversations with people other than my family, it'd kind of be hushed. And when Black Lives Matter, that movement really started sprouting, there was All Lives Matter, which is a protest to our protest. And so I don't understand why it's such a, there's such a bad stigma around talking about race. People are uncomfortable and they don't want to have to acknowledge what they're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and if we talk about slavery, white people get really uncomfortable like, well, I didn't do that. My ancestors didn't do that. Your people did that. And I'm not, I don't know. It's just, I don't, people can't take, accept responsibility. Um, and so if somebody said something wrong to me about the color of my skin and I told them that that hurt my feelings, they would defend like, oh, I didn't mean that way. You shouldn't be upset about that mm -hmm. because they don't, as I said, don't want to accept responsibility. And so I was also really scared because every conversation I tried to have with my friends about this, every conversation I tried to have at other, my fam with my family's parents or with my uh, grandparents or with my uh, friend's parents, it didn't work out well because they didn't want to talk about it. Mm. Um, and on the news, when people tried to talk about race, it didn't go over well. And so I was, of course, really scared to talk about it in front of all these people because I didn't think it would go over well. I didn't think people would care. I didn't think it, people would think it was important. But I knew, um, I still knew through all of that in my heart that it was important because it was affecting me and it was affecting all people of color in the United States, in the world. And so I really tried my best to let go of the fear and really talk about what I knew would help people. Mm -hmm. And quite the opposite happened, actually. You're, you were afraid that people would not embrace you or your message. You were afraid that people wouldn't want to talk about your yeah. message. Um, but quite the opposite happened. <laughs> Actually, overnight you became a household name. <laughs> what was that like for it you? It was really crazy. I got home after the march, and the first thing my mom did 
was go look at a house because we were in the process of moving. Um, and so I was kind of just sitting in my room. My mom told me not to look myself up because she didn't want me to do that alone. Um, I did anyway. But I <laughs> <laughs> Never a good idea. <laughs> and I, I found a bunch of people on Instagram and Twitter stealing my identity. And that was like nailed. What do you mean? You had imposters? Yeah. And it was really... Like fake accounts yeah. popped up overnight in your name? Yeah. That's creepy. Yeah. And I never experienced that before. And then... Um, I went over because Carter, the person I planned the walkout with, um, lived across the street. So I walked over and we were playing video games. And then, um, as my, you do when as you're you 11. Do, and then my aunt comes over and she says, You need to go to the house. And so I go back to the house, like a minute walk. And then my mom's like, Ellen's producer is on the phone. And so casual. I was like, <laughs> We've all gotten No, that but that call, wasn't right? casual because this is like the night this all happened. I'm like, What? And so I've been watching Ellen since I was a baby. Like, Ellen is amazing. I'm like, excuse me? Um, and she, and so she, I talked to her. She was like, oh, like, maybe Ellen like saw your speech and she'd really like to get in contact with you. And I'm just like, what? No. Um, like, that doesn't happen to me. Um, and so then by the end of the night, I found out that I was going to be on the Ellen show. And that is still the most exciting thing that has ever happened to me. <laughs> She, I've been watching that show. I cannot explain to you how long I've been watching that show. I like would watch it with my mom. It was just an amazing experience. Um, and so it was definitely pretty weird. Yeah. But I'm so grateful for the platform I have now. It's definitely hard to find a balance between school and, and homework and friends and what I do. Yeah. Um, and so for me, school will always come first. Um, and so I don't, I don't know, I'm just, I'm so grateful. Yeah. Because a lot of people try to have their voices heard and they don't. Right. And so I really don't want to use my platform just for me. I don't want the spotlight just to be on me, but I want to give other girls of color a platform so they can share their stories. So that yeah. it's not me, as I said before, representing them. I realize it should be them representing them, yep. but together. Love it, love that. I just have to say, um, I'm a little heartened at how excited you are about Ellen calling you um, and that you even know who Ellen is because when we talked about the fact that George Clooney called you, you there was a little bit of like a, I was like, do you remember what George Clooney said? She was like, um, not really. <laughs> like, do you know who George Clooney really is? I mean, don't make me feel old right now, but... Um, but at least we, we have Ellen DeGeneres, mm -hmm. a love for Ellen in yeah. common. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to talk, I want to go back to the walkout before we move on. There's so much more to talk about in terms of the work that you're doing today. But going back to that walkout, what were your specific goals for that walkout? And ultimately, what were the tangible, lasting effects from that experience, whether it was about cultivating a sense of community of activists on your campus or feeling seen and heard from adults. Um, what has been the lasting impact? It was definitely really amazing to see all these news networks and all these adults caring about what we had to say, 10 and 11 year olds. I thought that was so amazing because when you think of politics and you think of activism, you don't think of 10 and 11 year olds. And so having adults listen to us and having people actually care about what we had to say was so amazing. And it also built a sense of community with these kids. Mm -hmm. we, um, we built a press packet, we talked to the press, we, we organized this together. And so I feel like with these these kids from my elementary school, we still have this sense of community. Mm. And we, we started this together, mm -hmm. and we can finish it together. That's beautiful. Um, you give us hope. Uh, you give all of us hope. I think I speak for everyone when I say that. Um, so now that you found yourself with this massive platform, global platform almost overnight, um, you decided to pivot from that original message um, that centered on gun violence. Talk about why and talk about how you've shifted the focus of your activism since that day. So I, once I got, gained my platform, I began talking to so many amazing people, um, so many amazing older black women about their lives and how this has affected their lives. And I learned about so many other issues that black girls face that have names, that have like official names, like adultification and adverse discipline. I didn't think that 
people cared about it that much. Mm. Um, and so having conversations with some of my mentors and watch, reading articles and learning more about stuff that I know affects me, but that I didn't know was such a, a, was a thing that people actually did research on. Mm. Um, after having so many amazing conversations, I just, I felt like it was important that even if you, I'm an upper middle class black girl, so I'm not in the inner city, I'm not experiencing stuff like that, I could still, um, reach all all demographics, and so that it wasn't just me talking about one specific thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a conversation with Jamila Jamil, and she is just the most amazing person I've ever met. She is. Wait, can we pause and say yeah. how you got that opportunity oh, yeah. to interview um, her? Because I, it Ellen, goes back to our girl Ellen. <laughs> Ellen offered me a digital show, and so Same. I. <laughs> um, so I did a so I. So I did a digital show. Um, what was with, it called? Uh, Diversity, T-E-A. Um, <laughs> Explain to the adults in the room what okay, tea like, is. Okay, like tea is like, um, like drama, like spill the tea, like <laughs> kind of get where I'm like. <laughs> um, Do you guys get it? You don't get it. Okay. Yeah, I see people get it. <laughs> I know you get it. <laughs> Um, and so, and it's on YouTube, by the way. So if you haven't seen it, you need to check it out after today's mm -hmm. talk. And definitely the most—that was one of the most amazing conversations I've ever had. Um, Jamila does a lot of work with self-love and self-care and owning who you are, and so and changing the the definition of beauty so that it's not just a blonde white girl who looks like Barbie, but it's us. It's it's you. It's you, and it's everybody. Everybody's beautiful. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And definitely after talking to Jamila, I, I found a new love for myself. Mm. And I found like, she's just the most soothing person. She's so beautiful. She's British, which is awesome. Um, she, <laughs> I don't know, it, just, it comes across different. By the British accent. Um, <laughs> and she, she was just so empowering and so inspiring. Mm. And she talked about how she was bullied when she was younger and how she she grew up and how she realized that she was beautiful and that she can love herself for her stretch marks and for her fat. She could love herself for who she was. And so I really wanted to talk about loving yourself and feeling valued because often girls of color feel like they're not valued mm -hmm. because we don't see ourselves in the media. We don't see ourselves in books or TV shows or movies. So we feel like we're not important. And so talking to young black girls and teaching them how to love themselves um, is something that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, on um the, along the lines of beauty, um, I mean, we all can't ignore the fact that you've since chopped off <laughs> your fro and you have this adorable mini fro now. Um, and while at first it might seem like a superficial topic to bring up her haircut, in fact, it's not because black hair is so politicized in this country. And I do believe that for a black woman or girl to embrace her natural beauty, it is a form of activism. And um, so I want to talk to you about the decision to cut your hair, yeah. how you came to that decision, and what that journey has been like for you. So I watched the Netflix show, Napoli Ever After. And after watching that show, it's basically about a black woman who struggles her entire life with her hair. And one night, she just decides to shave it all off. She broke up with her, with her boyfriend of like two years, and she's in a really dark place. Mm -hmm. And I've been in really dark places, and I know what that's like. And she, I think she was drunk, but oops. But she, she shaved. She, but you don't know what that's like, right? No, but she shaved. Just to be clear, she shaved her head. And after that, it's really about it. It. it talks about her journey in segments, so like new growth, braids, pixie cut. So I just think it's about her becoming who she is mm -hmm. and embracing who she is. Because when you said something really interesting, when you're a black girl and you have a lot of hair, that's what people see you for. And so cutting off all your hair, that's, that's embracing who you are because they're looking at your face. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was begging my mom for months. I was like, I want to cut all my hair off because I want to see who I would be without my hair. I've struggled with my hair my entire life. And people always, were always touching it, telling me it was weird. And it wasn't me changing myself to make them more comfortable. It was me making them uncomfortable mm. because I'm going to be bald. And, I, and I'm a girl. What? Um, and so I, I, I did it. My mom finally let me. And 
it, it was a really amazing experience. I felt free. I, I felt like this thing that has carried so much weight on my shoulders was gone. Mm. And I felt, I felt scared because people were looking at my face all day, every day, and they weren't just looking at my hair. Um, but it really helped me love myself even more because I don't focus on my hair that much. I look at my face. Um, and learning and how to- And a beautiful face it is, <laughs> right, Thank you. by the way. Um, and learning, <laughs> mom, and learning. <laughs> I love that her mom clapped. I was the um, first one to clap at that. And so I don't, I don't know. I just, I love it so much. And I'm so excited for it to grow back because I feel like new growth, new growth as a person, new growth for my hair. I just have to say, sorry to all the men in the room. For one moment, I'm talking to the, the ladies. I really believe that every woman at one point in her life should cut all her hair off. It, there is nothing more liberating. There's nothing more exposing. I think it's important that we all confront who we are in the mirror and learn to love that woman yeah. apart from your safety blanket that often is your hair. We're often told that you are beautiful based on the texture, the length of your hair. And, and hair grows back. And hair grows back, by the way. Especially to the black girls, we are told, never cut your hair because it won't grow back. <laughs> Listen, we've both cut our hair off. It grows back, OK? So don't believe the lies. Um, all right, so coming back to uh, the topic of youth activism, um, obviously we're all watching so many different uh, youth-led activist movements taking shape, taking hold in our country. Um, why do you think the youth are being mobilized so effectively uh, at a time like this, and what do you think the long-term impact will be of these youth-led moment, yeah, movements? I think that for um, me, it was seeing other kids um, doing activism and speaking up for what they believe in, and that makes that made me want to do it, that I, they can do it, I can do it too. Like We can be a community, we can do this together. And I've had people come up to me and say that they want to do something like me, they want to do something because they saw me doing it. And so I think it's like once you see that it's possible, you really want to jump a hop on the train mm -hmm. and experience that and talk about what you believe in. Mm -hmm. And I think, it's, I think it's so great that we're not just talking about race, we're talking about global warming, climate change. Um, shout out religion, to Greta. Sa shout out to Greta. Uh, religion, we're talking about everything that's important to every child in this world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's dawned on people that it's our world that the adults are giving to us. And so we should probably take care of it, especially the climate, because we're letting the earth die. Um, and so I just, I, I really, I really think it's such a great thing that everybody is starting to embrace issues mm -hmm. and really become t comfortable talking about it mm -hmm. so that it's not just a sketchy subject that you don't talk about um, and that your family argues about on Thanksgiving. It's like <laughs> this, this conversation that we're comfortable with having. Yeah. And I think that what's also great is that people, um, well, one thing I don't like is that people are becoming pretty immature with their political beliefs. So mm, I, say actually, more about that. I actually have a friend who supports Trump and she's still one of my really good friends. And she's white, and she's, and I know that's probably hard for a lot of people to believe, but she's still one of my really good friends. She's a family friend. I have a friend who's black, and he supports Trump. And I have a friend who's Indian, and he supports Trump. And I think that being able to put your political beliefs aside and really have a relationship with somebody says a lot about your maturity level. Um, and so I don't, I, I don't, I don't know, I just, I think it's pretty immature of you to stop talking to your grandma because she doesn't like immigrants. So, I, I don't know. Sips tea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that it's great that a lot of people are realizing that people are more than who they support and people are more than what they, what the policies that they want to see put in place. Ooh. Because people, I, I'm friends with people um, who, uh, don't who don't want stricter gun laws. They don't think it's that big of a deal. They want everybody to be able to have a gun. And that doesn't mean they're not like my grandfather. I mean, my mom has a friend um, who doesn't agree with what I'm saying when I talk about guns, but that's fine because he still loves me and I still love him. And mm. so I shouldn't really change my relationship with him mm. just because he doesn't believe what I'm saying. And I think it's, it's supporting each other and lifting each other up and not pushing each other away because we don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. And so if we can really connect um, over something that's not just the fact that we assume that somebody's racist is really um, important. 
That is a word. That is a message that our country desperately needs in such divided times. Um, I'm curious, since you have all these Trump supporting friends, what have you learned from them about their, um, the, their experience that has led them to support a president like Trump um, and so his policies? I'm, I'm a little confused with the black friend I have who supports Trump, but um, <laughs> I... Understandably. <laughs> um, but one thing that I, I don't... I don't talk about it with them. Mm. Um, I kind of, just like they don't talk about my activism with me. We kind of are friends for being friends. Mm. Um, and I, I just, I really, I love them. And I, I support them. And even though I don't agree with them, because you can agree and not agree with people and still love them and still have a relationship with them. And so there's, I've learned that they're not bad people and that my friend, who is my age, who supports Trump, she's not a bad person. She's one of my really good friends. And I, don't, I think it would be, like I said, immature of me to just push her away because I don't agree with her. And so I've learned that just because somebody wants a certain policy to be put in place or because somebody doesn't agree with you doesn't mean they're automatically a bad person, doesn't mean they're automatically a racist, doesn't mean they're automatically just a bad person in general. Please clap if you needed that reminder today. I have chills, just, just letting you know. Um, going back to the youth activism point, I'm curious because there are a lot of adults in this room. From your perspective, what, what is the role that adults can play in supporting youth activism? So a lot of people have said to me that they're handing over the world to the younger people. And I don't think that's true. I mean, you're still alive, and it's everybody's responsibility <laughs> to make this world a better place. And so you shouldn't <laughs> just give up because other people, you think other people are doing your job for you. This is the earth you live on. This is the society that you live in. And so you should be taking care of it just like we are taking care of it. And it's unfair that we have to step up and take care of the world because you have refused to. But it's, it's what we're doing. And so you need to step up now because it's your time too, mm -hmm. and you d need to help support us. Mm. One of the things I love about you and your message is that it goes beyond just talking about the issues, right? Yeah. And yet here we are, once again, <laughs> talking about the issues. Um, perhaps in a bit of a, uh, we're kind of preaching to the converted here. Yeah. But what can students in the room who are inspired by you, who are looking for ways to really positively affect change, what can, what can they learn from you today about taking action? Yeah. How, do we, how do we go beyond just talking about these issues, using our voices, and really taking action? Yes. on the problems facing our world. So a lot of people think that by coming to events like this and by coming to summits and um, by listening to other people talk, um, they're doing something. And like, of course we're doing something by sitting here, but we're not actually doing something. I mean, we're having a conversation about the stuff we already know. And you guys are listening um, to a conversation about stuff you already know. And so it's really important for you to recognize that coming here isn't doing something and that you should look you shouldn't look to us and say that you want to do what we're doing or say that you want to do what Blank's doing, but you should want to start to do what you think is going to have most of an impact. And it's just do what you want to do. Do what you think will affect your community. And it doesn't have to be on a national level. It can be on a, young, it can be on a glo uh, local level. It can be anywhere you think is important. I often tell people, um, I usually tell younger people this, but I think for if you're older, it applies too. Um, success looks like you, because you shouldn't look to others for your definition of success, but you should find it within yourself. As I just said, you should look and see what you think is successful. So if you think that you should put up flyers in your school, you should do that. If you think you should host a panel, you should do that. If you think you should arrange a local event, you should do that. And so I really think that finding within yourself what you think is going to be most impactful is what you should do because a lot of times people say they want to be like somebody but you should be like you and you should do um, speak on the issues that you think are imp um, you think is important to you so when I was writing my speech for the March for our lives I wanted to talk about gun control and yes that's a really prevalent issue in today's society but that's not something that is so important in my life it's not, I'm not affected by it and so I really 
as I said, wanted to talk about something with my true authentic voice. And so you shouldn't talk about whatever issue is trending or whatever you think people are going to listen to the most. You should talk about what affects you and whatever you can understand the most. Well, I know you say that we shouldn't look at someone else and, and want to be like them, but I'm sorry. I think everyone in this room wants to be a little bit more like you, <laughs> Naomi. So tell us, at 12 years old, how do you define success? Um, whatever makes you proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, if I, I'm not good at, in art class, but if I draw <laughs> something and it doesn't turn out the best, I mean, I'm still proud of it. Um, I still drew it, I still worked hard on it. If I write an essay and it's not my best work, but I, I still tried my best and I still worked hard on it, it's, it's still my best work. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't be so hard on yourself and break yourself down because oftentimes you look in the mirror and you say, well, I don't like my nose, I don't like my hair, I don't like the way I sit like this, I don't like the fact that I got to be on my essay. So really not being so hard on yourself and learning to accept yourself because that is the truest form of success is being able to accept yourself. Woo. I'm inspired. I don't know about you guys. We are going to move to Q&A in a minute. So anyone who has a question, I'll give you a second to come down to the two mics that are um, in the front. So please do come forward. If she's 12 years old and can speak on this stage, you too can come up to a microphone and ask a question. Um, but it, while I wait for you to come up to the microphone, I will ask one last question, which I think is a really important one. Um, because we do see you as a bit of a hero, but you're also human and you are 12. So how are you managing ba this finding balance um, between just being a 12 year old and also doing really important activist work in the world? Well as I said in the beginning, school's always going to come first. Um, my academics are always what's most important because that's how I'm going to have a successful future. Um, being educated is one of my greatest gifts. Um, and so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying not to miss a lot of school. I miss some school for this. Um, but, Homecoming she missed for this, guys, by the way. But it's okay because I'm at a K through 12 school, so I'm going to be there for a while. Um, <laughs> and then she was like, but I'm also missing it to be in New York. But. I love New York. Um, <laughs> I just, it, you have to find a healthy congruent balance between work and life. And so you probably, even if you have a job and you're working like 40 hours a week, that might not be the healthiest for you. And so you should find out like what's best for you. And so I don't think, I, last year and the year before, I missed so much school. And that didn't do well for my academics. I was so behind. And so really missing an amount of school that's helpful and that allows me to still be successful in my academics, but that allows me to still be successful um, in, in life and in what I'm, the work I'm doing is really important. Well, thank you for the work that you do and thank you for all the ways that you inspire all of us in this room. And thank you for standing up and asking a question for being the one solo brave soul. <laughs> I will turn it over to you. Yes, um, thank you so much for the both of you for being here. Like after listening to everything you've had to say, I feel so inspired and grateful that I had time to come here and be in the room. But my question is, when you do a lot of social justice work and you put on um, a lot of emotional labor into the work that you're doing, um, what, what things um, make you feel like back to center? Mm -hmm. Or like, how, what do you do to protect your energy when you are dealing with a lot of issues that are affecting you personally or the people that you have come to know? Mm. And so, yes. That's a great question. That Thank is. You. So your health and your mental state should always come before the work that you're doing because I often feel like I have to put on a happy face and do the work that I'm doing and I have to go to this event and smile and pretend that I'm fine even when I'm not fine. And so you should come first. And if you don't feel comfortable, you shouldn't do anything um, that you don't feel comfortable with. Um, I love to do yoga. I love to... Well, I don't really do it that much, but when I do journal, it feels really good. Um, I love writing, um, not even just writing about myself, but writing stories. It kind of releases the tension. Um, you should, I mean, often I feel like I'm saving the world. We're all saving the world, so I shouldn't shave myself. And so you have, you're, I assume you're an activist. You put so much 
energy and effort into the work that you're doing, but you should put energy and effort into taking care of yourself because you are beautiful and important and you're valued and you need to take care of yourself because you're what's most important to yourself. Yeah. Preach. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. <laughs> like seriously, because that was a reminder that we all need to remember like, you can also ask for help and you're not always the one that needs to provide support. Yeah. Like it's the question of who heals the healer when mm -hmm. you're used to taking on that role. And so, yeah, mm. thank you so much. Mm. Thank you. And we have another one. All right, hi. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for being here. I was kind of up there like crying the entire time um, <laughs> because you know, being a black woman, our whole life is politicized. And so, like you said, an act of like loving yourself and being yourself is, is an, it's an act of activism. And so I'm really happy to see you here. I'm not gonna cry again. Um, and you know, you just give like so much hope and you're so inspiring. And so I kind of want to know like, you know, what's next for you? Are you taking it like just one day at a time? Or, you know, what, what are other things like you want to work on? Um, I want to work on myself. I know I've talked about self-love a lot, and what I'm doing is very important, what all the activists are doing is very important, but I often feel like I don't love myself, and so I need to focus on myself before I can focus on other people, so that's really what I'm going to focus on. Over the summer, I took a, um, a break so that I could have some time for myself, and now that I'm starting up again, I feel pretty energized, and I feel like I'm back at it again, um, and so I don't know. I just... I'm glad that what I said about self-love was helpful to you. Um, and I mean, just just be yourself, honestly. I, I don't even know you guys, but I feel like I have this community within you. Um, and so definitely take care of yourself. And I don't know what's coming next, honestly. I mean, my mom probably does. She's, <laughs> uh, she's my momager, but <laughs> um, so probably ask her that question, <laughs> but, but overall, I'm just really glad what we said was helpful to you. Of course. Uh, Thank you, and you yeah, know, keep doing black girl magic. First of all, I'm just going to say, like, your spirit and your energy is just amazing, and just it resonates with, like, so many people, I imagine, in here, too, and just, I'm just just in awe of like your presence and just like the way you present yourself and everything. And just to kind of piggyback on her question a little bit, in your highest aspirations within the next 10 years, where do you envision yourself seeing, like what do you see as like your goal and what you, I feel like you've already accomplished like so much in life and you seem like they're definitely an ambitious young woman, like you feel like a woman, <laughs> like just the way you speak, but it's like what do you see for yourself like and as you mature into like a woman woman? Um, I want to be an actress or a journalist or both. Um, I, I don't know, I just, I love writing so much. And I think that often the media writes from a, uh, from a perspective that they think the people want to hear instead of from the perspective that they need to hear. And so I really want to be one of those journalists that it gives off information and still writes opinion pieces but gives the facts because I don't want to give you a biased, slanted view of what's going on in politics or what's going on in society. Um, and I think it's really important to have journalists like that. I want to be the executive president of the New York Times because a few years ago, um, I, I looked at their um, senior editorial board and there was one black guy. And so I'm not really happy with that. Good for him though. Um, <laughs> so I really want to bring diversity to, um, to higher um, points of journalism so that it's not just straight white men telling you how, what you should believe, but it's a bunch of different views um, and perspectives on what they um, can, on what you should think, or not what you should think, what you should um, do to make the world a better place. Um, also, an actress. I love acting. Um, my school has plays, thank goodness. Um, I love to sing. Maybe I could be in a musical. Um, so yeah, I also want to go to Harvard. Okay. Well, continued blessings on your journey as you continue to inspire the world, and just God bless you and all the work that you're doing. And kudos to your mother just for raising just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal. Very good. Very Hi, beautiful. How are you? So great to, to have you here. Um, so my question is, you're a 12-year-old, you know, and it's, it's insane to me because where I was when I was 12 years old 
and just kind of like where I am now is kind of like a whole different mentality. Um, yeah. And just like being in the in the in the public in the forefront, I can't imagine what kind of pressure you face. Can't imagine the kind of like negative negativity that is thrown at you every day. Um, so my question is, as of right now, how are you dealing with all the pressure that is kind of like coming on you to kind of be like the voice, you know, the kind of like like a forefront voice, you know what I mean? Like a main yeah. voice of, of, your, of your generation. And um, I don't know, how do, how do you feel like maybe the possibility that where you are right now and where you're gonna be, like when you're my age, I'm only 10 years older than you, you know? Like, do you feel like things will change and how your mentality will change and where you wanna be in life? And like, you have a lot of aspirations, you know? And we, I think we all did when we were, when we were kids and you know, you have kind of, when you, we get older, whittle it down or like it kind of just like shifts, but um, how do you deal with pressure? And um, you know, how do you plan to kind of go forward and actually, I don't know, give and take of like what you plan to do? So I definitely, as I get older, don't want to lose my energy because I feel pretty energized and pretty motivated and purpose driven, but I don't want to lose that because I know some people, they want to, they have these big aspirations when they're younger and then they grow up and that doesn't happen because they, they, somewhere along the way, there's a stick in the road and they feel like they can't do it anymore. Um, and so I really am working to take care of myself so I can believe um, that I can do it and that I can go to Harvard, I can be a journalist, I can be an actress um, because I don't want to lose motivation. Also, one thing that's really helpful is my mom because she gives me a choice in what I want to do. So she'll say, do you want to do this? Do you not want to do this? I don't care because I know a lot of parents in the industry do exploit their children. So I'm really glad that I have a great support system um, who takes care of me and I know not everybody has that. So one of the things that I really um, love is the idea of mentorship. Um, and going to someone if you need um, help, if you need somebody to guide you, um, so that it's not just you alone. Because let's say your parents aren't in the picture, you don't have the greatest people who you can go to, but finding an adult that you trust um, who you can talk to about things. Big facts. Thank you, Mom, for just raising an Seriously. amazing child. Seriously. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much for your question. <laughs> I'm in awe of you both. What can a white mom do of teenage girls to help? You can talk to your daughters about what's going on. Um, a lot of the things that um, parents do, it's like a generational ignorance. So they don't really talk to their children and they don't let their children watch the news. And so they shelter their children. And eventually their children are going to grow up and they're going to go out into the real world and they're not going to understand what's going on and they're going to think they're going to be surprised by all the racism and violence that's going on because they wouldn't have known so the most important thing you can do is talk to them and I, I do talk to my children I have a daughter who's in school here who fortunately couldn't come um, I, I'm so thankful for your words and your activism thank you of course are you okay <laughs> I'm in awe I feel like I'm just looking at superstars and, and I'm worried about the world and thank you. Yeah, yeah I just like <laughs> Just can't handle that. <laughs> well, before we wrap, oh, I'm sorry, we have we have one more. Okay. With a gorgeous wrap on. Thank by the you. Way. Thank you. Um, so my question is, I think that it's really important, and I and I gather from like the work that you're doing that you're looking at different resources. There's a lot of mentors that you have access to. If you were to create an essential guide of some sort of how folks can like get engaged in the issues, if there's like books, movies, people that people should know, what is that for you? Um, Great question. It's a hard question. It's good too. Um, definitely find your people um, and figure out what you like. I don't really know if I have anything specific. Um, Elaine was asking me something specific the other day and I totally blanked. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess like, wh how did you get engaged in the issues? I think that's like maybe a, a yeah. good starting place. So I found the issue that really inspired me 
Um, and I, I kind of worked my way up from there. And so definitely having conversations with people, finding your people, and having people that you can talk to and cry in front of and really share your experiences with is so important because if you have people that don't fully support you, you're not going to be able to do your best work because you're going to feel like something is wrong with you and with, wrong with the work that you're doing. And so definitely find the people that can support you. Um, look up to yourself. So not really, you can look up to other people, definitely find a mentor, somebody you can talk to about issues, but also look up to yourself and be proud of yourself and learn how amazing you are and how much you can do because a lot of people look to others and say, I can do that, I do that sometimes, but look to yourself and say, I can do that, mm. I can do what I wanna do, mm. I can do what I think I can do or I know I can do mm. and so I think that's really important. What was the name of the documentary you watched that Napoli inspired you to after. cut your hair? Napoli Ever After. Cool. Thank you. I'm just curious, what's the best book you've read lately? Um, I'm reading The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. Ooh, that's a good one. A friend recommended it to me. It's, she's brilliant, Yara Shahidi. Um, she, <laughs> no, she's really one of the greatest people I've ever met. She's so sweet, mm -hmm. um, and she's, really, really smart. And so mm -hmm. she's definitely one of the people I look up to. Mm -hmm. And she recommended the book to me, and I'm reading it at the moment, and it is so good. Mm. Best movie you've seen lately? Um, Who has time to watch movies when you're changing the world and oh, you have homework I do. to Trust do? Me. Um, <laughs> oh, good. What? Well, I like, um, it's a TV show. It's on my block. It's about, <laughs> um, I really like it. Uh, could you help me explain it? I, I love the show. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's about these young, um, they're high schoolers. Um, I think, I don't remember the neighborhood specifically, but they're in LA. Um, they're in an area that's mostly black and Latinx folks. Um, and they're just like, they just started high school, and so they're dealing with regular high school things, but also just like the violence in their communities. Um, there's some um, turf wars that um, they're involved with, not like directly, but like being impacted yeah. um, as, you know, being a sibling for someone who's like a gang leader, for example. Yeah. Um, and the actors are like really good. I'm so impressed by them. And when I first saw it, I didn't know anyone else who was into it. So I've been like petitioned. I was like, y'all are not going to cancel my show. It's so good. Uh, <laughs> but that's how I would describe it in a, in a nutshell. Yeah, it's okay. a really great show. Is it on Netflix? It is. OK, we all have our weekend binging <laughs> assignment. Um, yes. And then I have to ask, favorite curly hair product? What is it called? Um, my mom again. Um, OK, uh, uh, my hairstylist recommended it to me. Uh, it's, OK, I'm just going to go with Pantene right now. OK. They're coconut curls. <laughs> we'll get back to you basic, guys. But, if any, but my mom has a picture. But my hairstylist recommended it to me. Um, and it, it's made from like natural stuff. It's like a salon hair care thing. OK. And it's really nice. OK. Um, Do we have time oh, one we more? have one more. Yeah, go from ahead. From a familiar face. Sorry. Hello, hello. I love your outfit. Thank you very much. Um, the two of you have been huge, huge, huge inspirations to me. Um, for a long time, so I, I appreciate the conversation today. Since we are in a university setting and you are also advising Georgetown, I'm curious about your perspective on the university's um, responsibility to move these conversations forward um, and to make the impact. Um, what impact do you think the university has on this, on these issues? Yeah, so I think that um, colleges are doing a really good job at engaging the students, mm -hmm. um, um, especially Georgetown, the new school, NYU, all the, all the big colleges, Harvard. I went to the Vision and Justice um, Summit. Um, I think that we're definitely in a different place because they're really um, exploring the art of scholarship, so not just path learning and studying to pass a test, but writing something extra on your essay and writing just because you feel like it and researching something because you want to. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the universities are doing a really great job and they should continue to nurture each individual student so that it's not just a class of like 100 kids, but you get to know them. And that might be hard, but you really, you give them the benefit of the doubt and you, you ask, you expect a lot from them um, and you hold them accountable because if you just, 
don't explain stuff to them and right. you don't help them along their way. It's not going to be helpful to them also. Um, the university administrators from the um, schools that I've gone to, mm -hmm. um, I just think they should continue to do what they're doing because they're all doing a really great job at engaging their youth. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really good question to end on. <sighs> I feel like we all just need a one big just cleansing breath. <laughs> just inhale and exhale. I think next time we're going to lead in meditation or something yeah. afterwards. But um, before we wrap, I just, I just want to ask your mother to stand up and let us all just shower you with praise <laughs> for raising this queen. It's so inspiring. Um, and Naomi, thank you for energizing us this morning. Thank you for inspiring us. And we all, I speak for everyone in this room when I say we are part of your community of support. And we can't wait to see what you go on to do in your extraordinary life. Um, that has already been so ex incredibly extraordinary and inspiring. And I just want to say to everyone who decided to spend your Friday morning with us, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful weekend. Naomi, you. you're a rock star.